what? Never part again. No, never part again. What? Never part again. No, never part again. And soon we shall with Jesus reign. And never, never part again. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for singing. Thank you, cooking class, for leading song service this morning. May the Lord bless you. Good morning, everyone, and happy Tuesday. And thank you so much for the cooking class students for that wonderful song service. And also, I would like to welcome our online audience. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we hope that we'll be blessed by the message for today. And again, I invite uh, Mr. Mats to come here for the, for the prayer and for the message to share. Good morning. Good morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful and beautiful morning. We may have the perception that it's a gloomy and rainy day, but we understand you will, and you know this is best for us. So we ask that you endow us with your spirit today so that we may do as you wish. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So yesterday, no, before yesterday, that was a wonderful song service. Wasn't that inspiring? And we need to keep music. We need to keep songs and hymns in our hearts. That's how David survived. By, anyway, yesterday I was going to show you some pictures. But I remembered after I left that I left out a couple of tidbits that are important for the overall plot. Okay, so we're going to go back just a tidbit. Uh, I had a farm. I told you guys I had a farm. And I raised uh, slaughter, chickens, and laying hands. Okay, that's how we made a living. At one time, we had probably close to 12,000 head. And we also planted corn and rice. But... It was very interesting how the Lord works his, his plans out. We were very successful for nearly 12 years. And then all of a sudden, I mean, with no explanation, business started dropping, dropping, and dropping. And it got to a point where I had to tell my wife, either I go to work outside or we're going to have to sell the farm, go someplace else. we made the decision to sell the farm and go someplace else. In one week, in one week, I got a job offer and I sold the farm. Lord, I don't understand what you want. I mean, I thought you wanted me to live in the farm. Here I am in a farm with my family, but all of a sudden you put open this door, huge door. Okay, so I stepped into that door. Okay. Uh, now, we come back up to where we were. I was ready to show you guys some pictures. I was ready to show you the pictures that would make skeptics believers of miracles. Okay? But first, we're going to have one Bible verse for us to keep the Lord in mind always. Technology is great when it works. Anyway, Kevin, would you please? Romans 11, verse 33. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Yeah, sometimes we don't understand. 
what the Lord brings to us, what he does for us, and how he accomplishes the major thing that he needs to get our attention, okay? So I fell. I broke my neck. And this is what happened. I had to get a brace put in between my third cervical and my head so as my head wouldn't fall off, okay? Now, you can see there, you know how many days I stayed without having this surgery? 47 days. And there was something else that happened. I had other fractures. And the orthopedic said, hey, I've got to do something because your fractures are going to heal wrong. And I need to do the surgery. But I can't intubate you because of your next injury. But he suggested that we do the surgeries without anesthesia. I said, Lord, you must be preparing me for the great tribulations. So, I said, whatever you want, doctor, let's go. So, he takes me into the surgery, and he does something very interesting. He gets a piece of long rubber, and he wraps it starting at the tip of my fingers, and he goes all the way up to the, my shoulder, but really squeezing that rubber. Then he puts a tourniquet. And he takes that rubber off. He explained to me that what he was doing was taking the blood out of the member, okay? And that was good. I could see everything he was doing on my right arm. And as a matter of fact, he used some of the tools I use. They were a little cleaner, though. So it took about two and a half hours for him to do, oh, I forgot this this is a uh, picture of my mouth open as they take a picture of what was attached to my head. But oh, here now it's so sensitive. Okay, this is my arm. They had to put plates in my wrist so they would hold my hand, okay? It took about two and a half hours for the doctor to do this surgery. And it was okay. I could feel what's going on, but I, no pain. I just could feel the sensation, you know, of the drilling, the tightening of the bolts, and all that little stuff. Anyway, he's done. And he says, okay, this might hurt a little bit. So he comes to the tourniquet, and he releases the tourniquet. And the blood rushes to the tip of my fingers. And I cannot describe in any language I've learned the pain that I felt. But it's something like a few sledgehammers hitting your arm, okay, at the same time. But that's okay. That was over, done with. There was still the left arm. But that's okay. That was just, how can I say it, getting you ready for the next step. Then we found that my collarbone was broken. So they had to do that, the same thing. I, got so much, I had so much titanium in my body, I was worth a lot of money at one time. But most of it was removed, some with the arms. The one in the head was removed a few years later. This one is the only one that remains. I have... This one will only leave, I suppose, when Jesus returns. Anyway, so now I have to stay home because I had about, let's see, by this time I had about seven surgeries. And so I stayed home for about a year and a half without leaving the house except to go to hospitals. And I was the elder, at, one of the elders at the church. 
And so during that period, one of my friends, one of the other elders, came to me and said, what are you going to do all this time that you're going to stay home? I said, well, I got to read, but I, got, I need you guys to understand one thing. I had casts on both arms. I looked like a zombie, okay, with the arms out stretched like this and, and a brace between the rib and cage and the arm. And I had the brace on my neck. You know, I couldn't even turn when I'm turning today. So, okay, how are you going to read? You can't, you know, can't move the pages. My wife had to go to work. My daughters were in school. I was home by myself. How are you going to read? So he came up with this brilliant idea. He made something like a pedestal, similar to this. And he says, you can adjust the height, and you can change the, the pages with your tongue. I said, That's a great idea. OK, now what am I going to read? It crossed my mind that having, that being a pastor's son, I had never read one single book of the Spirit of Prophecy. Maybe I'll read the Spirit of Prophecy. So my friend brought to me the first testimony for the church. And I started reading that book. And I've got to tell you something. When I got to about page 60, 62, I was convicted that the religion I had been practicing until then had nothing to do with the religion that God had in mind for us. And so I didn't stop reading. I was reading continuously. And I read most of the testimonies for the church and a few other books. Now I'm convinced that I need to make some radical changes in my life. I used to eat tons of meat. I was the official barbecuer for the family, OK? And my family, there was at least 150 people. So when we got together, Mats, where are you? OK? Well, all of a sudden, within like three months, I told them I quit eating meat. They got so upset at me, you wouldn't believe. But anyway, that's another story. So we need to make these changes that we were reading about. Remember, my wife is not baptized yet. But she's going to, he, she had been going to church with me frequently. But we're making these changes together. And one change that she made on her own the day I went into the surgery, she prayed to the Lord. And she promised the Lord to stop smoking if I've survived the surgery, because it was an unknown. Well, as you can see, I survived. And then she's telling me this later. The day we went home, she was taking a shower. Lord, you know I can't stop smoking by myself. So you're going to have to help me. And let me tell you, she smoked three packs a day. The first thing she did in the morning before kissing me was to light a cigarette. Can you imagine? How can anybody want a cigarette? Anyway, that, so... That day was the last day she smoked a cigarette. We didn't realize all this, OK, until later, years later, we started talking about the details. That night, since I'd been in laying down for a month and a half, two months now, I didn't sleep a lot at night. As a matter of fact, I didn't sleep a lot at all. And I noticed that she was very uh, un. Um, Restless, and she sweat a lot. Next morning, I asked her if she was okay, and she was soaked. She changed her clothes. We didn't think anything more about it, and this went on for like three weeks. 
What happened? The Lord was weaning her out of that habit at night. She never felt the need or the desire to smoke another cigarette from that, that morning on. Never. And I remember how long it took me to get over the habit of smoking. And I was totally, said, yep, yeah, it can only be the Lord. But anyway, that was just one of the consequences. Okay, so here we are making all these changes because we are now reading the Spirit of Prophecy together. Soon, I can go back to church. And I'm really, really uh, in, uh, convicted that I got to preach this to, to my fellow brothers and sisters. So I started preaching about the health reform and how what God wanted us to live was a little different than what we were living and making all these. And everybody was very convinced for a little while. Okay? We actually were studying um, the spirit of prophecy after church, after our potluck dinners. We would sit down for an hour, an hour and a half and read about reform. It went on for three or four months. Most of the church was involved. But then, one by one, people started not coming to these sessions we were having. About 2010, we, had, we got a new pastor. And I remember his first sermon. He was up on the pulpit and he says, I want to make this clear. In my church, no one preaches out of the spirit of prophecy. I was a little taken back. But I didn't have to worry too, too much because Right after that, he managed to get me removed from all of my um, offices, okay? All my duties in the church. I was a Sabbath school teacher. I was an elder and so on and so forth. So he removed me from everything because he claimed that I was participating in a dissident movement that was called Taquara, that was started by uh, alumni of Heartland, okay? Now, at that time, I had no notion about Taquara. I hadn't even heard of the name Taquara. But after having gone through this ordeal, and let me tell you, the ordeal was quite intense, the day that all this came down, I was the elder in charge of, it was the Sabbath of all the organization. And right after Sabbath school, two or three of the other elders came up and says, the pastor said that you're no longer an elder and we're going to take over from here on. And I had invited a speaker that came 150 miles to preach that day. And then as they're telling me that, I'm thinking, you know, if I walked up to the pulpit right now and I exposed this scheme, I know I would have had the backing of the whole church. But then a voice said to me, you don't have to defend yourself. I will. So I, I did nothing. I went and I spoke to the gentleman I had invited and said, look, this is happening and I'm, unfortunately you won't be able to speak any longer. And he says, hey, I'm used to this. I've had this experience in other churches. I said, okay. Now, this is the interesting thing. You know, the, all over the Seventh-day Adventist church, the three major disputed uh, points are 
the nature of Christ, the victory over sin, and perfection, right? Well, it's the same thing in Brazil, okay? And so his topic was going to be one of them. I don't remember which one, but it was going to be one of them. And so they had arranged for another speaker to preach. And when this gentleman started speaking, he spoke on the same subject that the speaker I had invited was going to speak on. And you know what was worse, or better, depending on the point perspective? He didn't mince any words. My speaker is going to be tactful, you know. This guy didn't mince any words. He laid it on the line. I was looking back a couple of times at the guys, that, at the other elders, and they were really squirming on their seats, you know. I said, okay, I see, Lord. I, I know you got it under control. So, we don't know everything that the Lord does and how he does it and why he does it, but it doesn't matter. Because there's one thing we can be absolutely sure. Everything he does is for the good of those that love him, right? Are you sure of that? Okay, let's just finish with this. Please, Kevin. The infinite minds of men are inadequate fully to comprehend the plans and purposes of the infinite one. We can never, by searching, find out God. We must not attempt to lift with presumptuous hand the curtain behind which he veils his majesty. Okay? Now, there's more. We can so far comprehend his dealings with us and the motives by which he is actuated that we may discern boundless love and mercy united to infinite power. Our Father in heaven orders everything in wisdom and righteousness. So, here we have it. Everything's motivated by love and justice and righteousness. And he's all-knowing. And best of all, he's all-powerful. But he respects our choices. He always respects our choices. I'm going to end here, and tomorrow will be the final day of my testimony. And I'm going to tell you how I ended up here. Okay? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for being so patient, so merciful, so caring, and so loving. We pray that you will give us a lot more of the Holy Spirit so that he can make us understand and accept what we don't understand about what you do with us and for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God for that wonderful testimony and that wonderful message. And for our online audience, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. And may God bless you.